to the webinar today. We're going to be talking about one of the first and most advanced tin can deployments to come out and get into the, the real world. We're going to be talking about a case study of a company called Lifeway. Uh, in case you haven't heard of them before, um, Nashville is known for many things. Nashville is the center of the country music world. Nashville has a big uh, healthcare presence. Nashville is the epicenter, the capital of the e-learning standards universe. And, and Nashville is also known as the buckle of the Bible Belt. And if you've ever been to Nashville, you've seen the, the Lifeway building dotting our, our skyline. They occupy almost thir all of a 13-acre campus in the heart of downtown Nashville. They are, in fact, the world's largest Christian publisher, provider of retail products in the world. The, the platform that we're going to be talking about today is designed to help develop church leaders. It currently serves about 60,000 churches and reaches about 3 million learners every week. And we're going to be talking about how you know, th this platform, their ministry grid, has taken advantage of tin cans. We're going to show this use case. We want to share this with the world because it represents many of the things that make Tin Can interesting. It talks about how Tin Can can solve complex challenges, how the data captured with Tin Can is actually driving some of their core business practices. And, you know, one of the things that's fascinated me over the last decade in this e-learning industry is how it seems to have pervaded every industry and every niche. Every niche. And here we see a prime example where you know, e-learning is, is, is developing leaders within, within churches. It's a great a great story, a great use case, and we're excited to start to share some of these with you. So first of all, a few logistics as we get started. My name is Mike Rustesy. Hello. Uh, joining us is Tom Gilbert. We'll introduce him here in just a minute. Uh, as we go through this, so feel free to put your questions into the, uh, the questions box in the webinar there. Jeff and Andy are standing by manning the webinar. They'll answer them as we go through the uh, presentation. They'll occasionally forward some to uh, Tom and I as we go. And we always try to save room at the end of the presentation to answer some of those questions. But if we don't get to your question, we will answer it and we'll actually send it, uh, out the answer to all those questions in a link after the webinar. We are also uh, recording this webinar. We'll send you out a, a link to that recording along with the, the answers to all of the questions that get asked. So feel free to you know, fire away and, and make this uh, an interactive discussion. So joining me today, Tom Gilbert. He's the Director of Technology and Transmedia Content at LifeWay. Tom spent the majority of his career in the publishing space with focusing on strategic business technology and digital asset management. Over the last 15 years, he's worked with some of their earliest and leading companies, launching the print-on-demand and the e-book self-publishing business models. Uh, his knowledge and expertise in this space were a really key driver uh, of this project. So say a quick hello, Tom. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you today. So transitioning now to, um, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to, to cover through, uh, throughout this presentation. We're going to talk about you know, how this is one of the earliest and more advanced in can implementations. And we, we want to dive in and highlight some of the actual real world business case problems that Tin Can solved in this particular instance and some of the solutions that we put in place. And all the while we're going to focus on you know, some of the key takeaways, some of the early lessons learned that we've, you know, we've come across by putting some of these practices in place from the beginning. <clears throat> so, First of all, why, why is this so sophisticated? And I, I want to set this stage early. It, it, this is mostly so sophisticated because they got started so early. We're not going to be talking about you know, adaptive, fancy adaptive neural learning algorithms or anything like that. We're not talking about rocket science technology. We're, we're just talking about the ability to do some simple fundamental things that Tin Can has enabled, and, but they're real and they're in production. They're serving real learners right now. So this is one of the, the most advanced Tin Can implementations, mostly because it got started so early. This project got started back in August of 2012. That's about 18 months ago. And to start to put that into a little bit of perspective, here's a a timeline of Tin Can's evolution. In uh, April 2000, or August, excuse me, <clears throat> October of 2011, Tin Can was just kind of coming out of the, its research phase. And in 2012, when we got started with this in August, it was still in a very draft version. It was in version 0.9 and about to head into a 0.95 draft version. Still six, eight months before Tin Can even got to a, a 1.0 stage. And in fact, we're going to talk a little bit how, about how this project and some of the lessons learned while we were doing actually con, uh, drove some of the requirements and how we shaped this, the specification 
going forward to, to further set some context of the time about when this project got started. There were, this was the adopters slide from back then. And as you can see, it was a time when just a few vendors were experimenting with this technology and geeks were prototyping things out. And in other words, they were early, early, early to get started. And, and one of the really exciting things that um, you know, I think this webinar and that being able to share this use case represents a big milestone for the tin can community is it's so important to be able to start to share examples of this stuff in the real world to show that it's not just a toy, it's not just an experiment, there's real technology, there's real benefits to real businesses that are happening. And I think that's a big part of what the community needs right now. And so we're really, really excited to be able to share one of this, this first one here, here with you guys and that we had a ton of registrants for this webinar. I'm really excited to see so many people interested in seeing these things. I think there's a real thirst for that. And uh, what I'm most excited about, though, is the pipeline of ones that are coming after this, too. The people who you know, got started a little bit, once the table was a little bit more stable around that 1.0 time frame. Those projects are going to start to be coming wrapped up and, and public. And I'm excited to, to share a, a lot of that stuff with you. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom right now to give you a little bit of an overview of you know, who LifeWay is and, and what this ministry grid project that we're talking about was all about, what some of their uh, business motivations were, and just to provide you with a little bit of context. All right. Thanks, Mike. But as Mike said, we are uh, headquartered here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we are one of the largest providers of religious and Christian resources in the world. Uh, go all the way back to 1891 as far as what we were as far as delivering content to our churches um, actually made up of seven different divisions um, three of which are the retail sides you may be more familiar with that are the logos on the screen um, b &H publishing group is our trade division which has uh, published a lot of new york Times bestsellers the vow the love dare um, our lifeway christian stores which operates 186 retail stores across the nation and the division that I work in is the Church Resources Division, which is the largest. Um, and we have a um, lot of different content that has to go to a lot of different age levels in a lot of different formats, from adults and students and kids to uh, media and film, live events, camps, uh, worship in the music business, uh, a plethora uh, of, of different content that has to be distributed, which learning occurs in. Uh, our division has one clear mission. Uh, and that mission is to actually serve churches in the mission of disciples, in their mission of making disciples. Um, we are, uh, our division views ourselves as a servant of the local churches. Um, and I know that you're, you're thinking, well, that's great. What does that have to do with e-learning? You guys are the church. What, how does this model apply? Uh, for us, we found that there's three critical areas that are uh, for churches to be successful in their mission that we have to supply uh, to them. Number one is they need to develop their leaders. Uh, number two is that it's proactively they need to be in a mode of launching new groups, new learning environments, whether that's a small group, a Sunday morning, what we would call a Sunday school or a classroom learning. Um, and then number three, the content is most important, whereas they feed their people. Uh, without the infusion of the knowledge and the training that goes along with that knowledge, those first two just simply become merely activities. So the question for us is we started looking at, at, at our history, and we, we've done a, a long legacy of, from the print production side and what we would call a traditional model. Uh, we really started looking at this training area, and one question was becoming obvious to us all the time is why aren't churches developing their leaders? So the, for us, we are standards-driven, and that's part of the reason we'll talk a little bit about with the 10 Can API. Uh, being a religious publisher, we view the Bible as, as part of our standard, and it gives us a very clear model uh, of, of what to do to develop leaders as far as our mission. Uh, what we were finding is that only one out of every four churches had a plan to train their, their leaders. So there were obstacles in the way. Uh, and we basically found four of them, um, which was that the leaders, first of all, they don't know how to train. Uh, they just simply are new to their positions. Uh, they don't know if they're doing it right. They don't know a whole lot about uh, leading. They're someone who's just taking on a small group and volunteered for it. Timing is it, time comes the con, excuse me time consuming um, the training is they really don't have the time for it. Uh, 
attendance is often poor if you hold a, a live event or a live seminar. We found that over the years of actually trying to hold live event seminars over uh, since the 1950s. We used to actually do live training events. Uh, these are a different age that we live in, and people can't afford to travel long distances for training and conferences. Uh, oftentimes, they don't have a plan. And then oftentimes it's too expensive for them. There are a lot of the churches that we serve are, are large mega churches, and large uh, percentage of them, though, are small rural churches, and they don't have the budget or the time, uh, and it's expensive for them. So what do they do? They can do nothing at all, or they can try to solve it themselves and, and run into the cost aspects of it. At LifeWay, we've actually come up with a model for effective training uh, that basically is composed of three different parts, and, and we found that that's critical for the health and unity of our groups. Um, and it needs to be skillful training, meaning it impacts the head, the heart, and their hands. Uh, it needs to be facilitated by the leader, uh, in, in our sense, a godly leader, uh, because that's we are going to reproduce who we are. So the leader is a critical aspect of it as well. And then. No matter what you do, the people and the learners, they have to be in a receptive posture. They're going to be most impacted by the training when they realize they need it and when the training meets them where they are. And that's really where we went to with the ministry grid. It's that synergistic system uh, that right where those three aspects meet, right in the middle is where the most effective training is. And that's where we've targeted the ministry grid to uh, meet them where they are in the way of their time. Uh, the way they want to learn, the formats they want to consume the learning in. It, it's customizable, it's scalable, uh, and it works for organization groups and networks, um, which can take the, the very best teachers, bring them into that local environment in a very, very cost-effective model. Uh, as Mike said on our timeline from where we were in a development sense, uh, we were actually merging a couple of systems together. A, a content delivery system uh, was in place, and we realized uh, the shortfall that it had. Um, so in August of 2012, we started looking at learning management systems and really starting to look at the landscape and the environment to see uh, what did we need to do with our data on the front end to be able to present to it, and then what were the standards that were out there for it. Uh, we became aware of Rusticy and the, specifically the 10 Can API um, in August timeframe and started uh, working with the team here. Uh, in October 2012, we signed the statement of work. And then, as Mike alluded to, uh, we actually had a lot of development to do. Uh, we went live on 11, 12, 13. So in November of 13 uh, is when Ministry Grid launched. Since then, we've been busy with 1.1 1, 1 and 1.2 releases. So the question became then, okay, well, if you're big on standards, why 10 can? Um, you know, standards are important for us. Uh, we have a tremendous legacy of uh, learning, but we need to be able to look to the future to say, what do we want to build on next? What is the next core foundation? Um, so that standard is important for us. Obviously, we looked at SCORM, and obviously because of SCORM, we looked at then obviously the 10 can API. Uh, at that time, where it was in its life cycle uh, was uh, one of the major factors as why wow, Tin Can was there. It was, it was early enough, uh, but it wasn't too early. So it, we knew that by the time we finished our development work, we could actually implement something on time. We have a, a wide variety of churches, and we have a lot, wide variety of products as well. And one of the things that we wanted to do was make sure that we could break out the learning activity from the framework itself or the app that was going to be presenting in it. Um, Tin Can was the factor that was already doing that and it already had talked about uh, splitting that apart and that was exciting to us as well. And I mentioned we needed LMS functionality, but we needed a flexibility to be able to adapt our front end requirements uh, that would allow the organizations to customize, uh, allowed us to track at different levels and tiers across organizations and networks, um, and then would present us a foundation for the different formats, so for video and for SCORM and user-generated SCORM files, uh, PDF and assessments. Uh, and then as last, as Mike said too, when we started researching the standard and we found out um, that Rusticy was literally right down the road in a neighbor. Uh, we wanted to kind of take advantage of the best of the best and, and, and work with them and partner with them on that. 
All right, well, thanks for that overview, Tom. It helps to set a lot of the context for what, where we are and what we're talking about here. We're, we're now going to dive into uh, the ministry grid, the actual product, and take a look at some of the specific components of the ministry grid platform and how they're each using Tin Can API and, and how we put all this together. Uh, so we've got a diagram up on the screen here showing a uh, high-level conceptualization of the Ministry Grid platform, and uh, you know, let, let's let's start with the fact that what we were after here was, you know, the ability to basically have a portal for that happened to also have a lot of learning functionality in it, and so you know, this is all centered around a, the a portal built on the the LifeRay platform that we're going to be talking about, and some some of the key requirements that we had to address here. We needed to be able to deliver this both in a browser and on a mobile device through an app on iOS and Android, and those apps needed to be functional whether they were connected or whether they were disconnected. We need to be able to deliver traditional e-learning SCORM courses and bring them into the environment. They ha have a lot of content on video that they wanted to take advantage of a, a CDN and a robust streaming server to handle their um, delivery needs in there. And that all of this data needed to be centrally aggregated, stored in a common format, and re reliably stored, and so that it could then drive uh, reports that fed into actual business processes. You know, the, the learning events often came into are, are, are coming into you know some of the actual royalty models and, and other things that are, are happening in here. That that presented some pretty unique tracking requirements. And so the the architecture that you're seeing on the, the screen here is reflecting uh, on either side the ability to you know, deliver and track content both online in a browser and also in a, in a mobile app, and then the ability to drive all of that data into one centralized repository, and we'll talk about some of these specific com components in a few minutes, and then you know, at, the, at the bottom of that diagram, it, it's driving data out into business intelligence, analytics, you know, business and process uh, type systems as well. Now, one of the big motivations here, too, is that we, we knew about the needs that we had today of doing you know, traditional SCORM stuff and, and video stuff and assessments and some of your pretty you know, traditional uh, learning type stuff. But we also knew that the, the LifeWay platform was, had a far broader set of content and experiences that we're going to want to be able to come into here in a, in a common format and kind of be future-proof to start to accept new types of experiences and to bring uh, richer events into uh, into this platform as well. So we're going we're to dive now into you know, some of the individual components of the solution, and we're going to start with the you know the video delivery platform. And and for this, you know, Lifeway is using the Bright Clove player. And you know, um, Tom's going to talk a little bit about the, you know, the the business drivers, the use cases for uh, the video plat and the specific platforms that they're using in here. Right, and, and for us, Bright Clove. Um with video in general obviously being one of the most user-friendly and widest forms of learning and training and, and just presentation formats, it, it's we've learned for um, several, several years uh, that it has to be a required component to a lot of the content that we're providing. So we, we have a, one of our authors is Beth Moore, um, and we learned long ago that she, uh, the video aspect is a huge complement to how learning occurs. Uh, Bright Cove was a vendor that we had looked at and had a relationship with. Uh, it allowed us to then uh, do, a, it had API support, which was critical for us. Um, they had the right tool set for us. Um, and we wanted, as, as Mike said, we wanted it to not just be entertainment. We wanted it to have business statistics that we had to track as well. But one of the biggest, biggest drivers that we ever had to be able to do was be able to look and say, how long are people watching these videos? How long can we track that? Um, we have royalty payments that and, and contractual rights that we're obligated to report back out um, to our authors and our content providers. Um, so that was a, a non-negotiable for us is that we had to be able to track it to the minute and to the second if needed um, based off the detail to be able to, to do that. Bright Cove obviously was a platform we chose, had the right tool sets that were adaptable for us to plug into, uh, and it, it was a good fit all the way around for us. So getting into that, now we're going to look at some of the technology. Well, how did we start putting this together? Why, where did Tin Can come into play? And so, again, looking at those high-level requirements, we needed to deliver this using the Bright Cove player that needed, with, a, with a streaming server that needed to be on a, a content delivery network on a CDN, which introduced some cross-domain issues that would have been a, um, a problem for SCORM. 
We also then had to you know, take a look at the business requirements to determine the types of data that needed to be captured. You know, specifically, that hard and fast requirement to be very precise about the you know, duration of the experience within the video. Um, that kind of drove some, some new requirements over here. And we, we, had, we had to take a high-level look at the business requirements and then turn that around and map that into the set of tin can statements that needed to be captured. And you want, one thing that is, was an interesting result that came out of this early project is we had done a few earlier proof-of-concept implementations with tracking video. The, there was a YouTube one and a, a couple others that we had out there. And what we, we sat back and looked at is even within our organization, within Rusty Software, we had taken three different approaches to tracking video based on you know, the, the different business requirements for the time. And so this is really informing the, the need to get in and look at something we're calling recipes, where you know, there's a big need, I think, for us as a community to come together and start to publish best practices for how to you know, do common tasks, for instance, how can we capture video? And that's one of the things we're really pushing on. You'll, you'll hear a bunch more about uh, from us over the next couple months is, okay, let's take a look at the first three or four implementations of a given pattern and find those commonalities and start publishing and collaborating on those commonalities so we can have one common parameter for capturing um, for capturing a certain type of activity. And you know, in this early stages, we're still forming industry best practices. This was a really good lesson to, to be learning early. You know, another thing is that um, we had started this approach with, we took a very SCORM-centric approach to how we were going to capture the uh, video events. In fact, we started with our SCORM driver product, which can essentially make tin can statements that mimic SCORM um, patterns. And as we got into there, we, we found it wasn't the right fit. Even though you could do this in SCORM, you know, taking a tin can first approach was, was really the, the better way to do it because, you know, the data model was just different enough. The things you wanted to know, the things you wanted to record, the ways you wanted to look at this, you know, it was just different enough that even though you could do it with SCORM, having you know, the, the tin can first approach where we could really more strongly model that data turned out to be uh, enough of a driver to kind of scrap the early work and go back and, and redo it. And so, you know, a few things came out of um, this particular project as well. And namely, we, we have a Tin Can Java li uh, library right now that we've published out open source. You can download it from uh, GitHub as well. And you know, one of the things we, we learned as well is we started to create these additional uh, client libraries to make Tin Can statements off of different platforms. We, we started to develop a pattern for how these client libraries should uh, be developed. So we, we now publish uh, several client libraries across different platforms, but they all kind of have the same sets of signatures and patterns so that people can, developers can work amongst them. We also started making a best practice of recording how we were doing things technically and publishing it out to the world. And you can take a deep dive into the technology behind uh, the, the mobile app, the, or I'm sorry, <laughs> behind the, the video player within this LIFO project at that URL that you see up on the screen. It, it's up on our blog. And we're going to continue to you know, publish as much of the uh, technological implementation details of these projects as we can as they start to complete and um, you know, as the vendors are, are willing to share the work that they're done. Uh, and we, and we hope that every Everybody can take advantage of those, take a look at under the hood about how these things actually work in, in practice and for the geeks in there, take a deep dive and start to you know, actually code them up themselves. And so summarizing, key takeaways from what we learned from the, this video section. First of all, business needs need to drive tracking. We need to start with what do we want to know about something from a business perspective? What questions do we want to ask so that we can know what information we want to capture, we, that we need to capture to answer those questions? And we've kind of taken a little bit of a, a mantra of capture what you need to know and then go capture a bunch more. We think that, you know, Tin Can, really one of its strengths is capturing a lot of information so that we can just ask other additional questions later on. We don't know what we're going to want to know five years from now. So, you know, let's capture anything that we think is relevant. You know, this is a great example of starting to leverage some of Tin Can's new capabilities. Again, going on that specialized delivery platform, the CDN, getting rid of the cross-domain problem, not having to have a SCO for our, our training. 
another key takeaway, even though it was tempting to take that squirmish direction because it could be done that way, it was actually at, at the end of the day very beneficial to back off and, and take a, a tin can first fresh uh, approach to, to do things in a new way. And you know, the next key takeaway was the need for recipes, the need to start publishing and coming together as a community to find these common patterns so that we can all, you know, do things in a consistent way. If we can get everybody reporting on videos in a consistent way, that means that the tools that seek to understand tin can statements are going to be much more powerful and have a much better, a much easier time providing us all with useful information. So let's jump now into the you know, the next portion of the, um, the ministry grid, the, the portal, the, the front end to all this, a lot of the glue that holds this together. And Tom will kind of describe some of the, the business drivers for this and its requirements. As Mike said, we did choose a portal uh, for this. One of, one of the reasons we needed a portal um, simply came down to the, the fact of how diverse our churches are, the ones that we serve, but yet each and every one of them is unique. Uh, they need the ability to be able to customize, they need to be able to brand it with their, and, and just their local content and upload and, and provide um, more effectively train their leaders by putting in the context of where they actually are. The social appeal too as well with the, with the modern the, the social media and the Facebook look, uh, the gamification through badging as well as it's going through the traditional e-learnings. These are all fairly new to us. Uh, we realize we're coming in from the outside as a fresh start. We had no preconceived ideas or uh, anything around what should be, um, no legacy system to start from, so we kind of just got to build it from scratch. One of the things that we were finding out is, is portlets that uh, it really allowed us to be able to take the building blocks and the Lego, so to speak, string them all together with the Tin Can API and present it as a unified platform to the end that they could customize, make their own, um, and then really truly uh, get the best benefit and, and where that they could position, position the training for their leaders off that. Um, there are a lot of different, uh, each organization can customize and each sub-organization within an organization can customize. So we really had to go with something that was a diverse platform that sat on top of this that would allow us that, that, that portal uh, framework. Great, so you know, again, some really interesting stuff going on here. You know, the, the biggest, you know, in, in my mind, one of the biggest, transformative impacts Tin Can is, is having on this industry right now is a, the transition from the requirement that the LMS be the center of the universe to you know, learning kind of blending into the background and the transition to more common mainstream tools such as the, you know, the LifeRay portal. This is a, an open source portal and collaboration technology that is used you know, throughout the world. It's not a learning tool, but in this case, it's the best solution for you know, delivering the platform, delivering the glue that ties these things together for the, the ministry grid um, application and for their users. And so you know, even though we have some learning type functionality, it turns out the best solution was to have you know, an existing, just a regular old portal piece of software, maybe a content management system, and then have learning specific components that feed into that through these individual portlets. <clears throat> And then also to have, you know, can be the glue that's holding a lot of those things together. Um, here at Rusty Software, we've, we've used the phrase a lot, um, tightly coupled yet loosely integrated. Or tightly, I'm sorry, tightly integrated yet loosely coupled to describe systems that are kind of made up of, of independent components, but they come together you know, seamlessly to you know, create a great learning experience. And we're seeing a lot of that is starting to emerge now with, with Tin Can Systems. I think this is a great example of how you have you know, the, the LifeRay portal, and then sitting behind that you have a learning record store. You also then have, uh, they're using our SCORM engine to deliver existing SCORM content. There's some assessment stuff, and, and there's you know, the mobile player, and this stuff all just kind of comes together to form a cohesive experience for the user, but they're all best of breed technologies for those specific use cases uh, that are all you know, running things together. Through the Life Cove port, or, excuse me, through the Life Ray portal, you can go you know, access your SCORM content, you can access your assessments, you can see your badges, you can you know, access the video content that, that's coming in through Brightcove. Um, you know, this, this is having a big impact on how a lot of organizations are, are looking to think about learning systems in general. And so that's the key takeaway from, from this part of the, uh, from the system, is to, you know, 
rethink the learning system, deliver training where it's needed. And uh, a lot of times the, you know, the center of the universe isn't going to be a learning management system. It's going to be a place that learners are comfortable going. It's going to be a place where learners are anyway. It's going to be something that's in front of them and not necessarily a, a strict formal learning environment. It's going to be something that is kind of our mainstream tools. Learning isn't necessarily a separate activity. Learning is something that happens every day through every interaction. And so many tools that we use every day are in fact learning tools, but we don't tend to think of them that way within our um, with our little industry here because we so often we have that requirement that things be you know, tracked and now all of a sudden it's possible to start to use them in a, in a much richer way throughout our systems. So the, so the third kind of pillar of this uh, solution is there's the, the mobile apps that we were developing here. And so Tom, tell us a little bit about you know wh where these were coming from and what the needs were driving for the mobile interfaces. Yeah, this was one by far one of the most critical pieces that we just had to have. Um, in, in today's world, obviously, the device is connected to the learner almost a, all the time. Uh, for us, it, it was uh, a non-negotiable point. If we couldn't make it work on the mobile, um, that really was a, a huge, huge issue. It was going to be a huge, huge issue for us. It fits the need towards two of our greatest demographics that we have in our leadership and our learning here as well. Uh, professionals, the busy professionals that obviously can't come to uh, seminars and they need to optimize their training time, uh, can download it, have it local uh, on their device, maybe catch a flight, do their training on the flight when they get back and they now have Wi-Fi access, um, or they will choose to with to the cellular data, cellular data, either one, um, it'll sync back up to the main app itself and to the web browser and, and track their progress uh, for them. Uh, so. That scenario and that business case for us was, was uh, obviously a big driver. Uh, the second biggest driver for us uh, deals with our churches themselves. Um, a lot are uh, smaller churches uh, and in rural churches where they may not have or couldn't afford. And it goes back to the cost of training. They may not be able to afford uh, a robust internet enough to be able to host uh, at the church. Um, so their members may be downloading it and then coming together to train together for live events and or use the, if they want to hold a, an actual physical training seminar. Um, the inverse of that is also true. Uh, perhaps the, the members may not be able to afford uh, the internet or have Wi-Fi access and so they can come to the church, download their training, take it with them on a device if they should have a mobile device or their cell phone um, and take that with them do their training, and then when they come back the next time, sync that back up to them. Uh, all the while, behind the scenes, no matter when and how they're training, we still, as a business, have to track that usage and the consumption of it. Um, so it comes from any SCORM content, any type of activity that we'd want to track. So this is a, a critical, critical piece for us. All right, so, so diving into you know, some of the technology that happened behind all of this. Uh, again, we have the need to be able to take things on data, modal apps we needed to be connected or disconnected, but still have robust tracking. This needed to include videos in addition to um, SCORM courses, and then all this data needed to sync back up to the server. And so Tin Camp became the, the natural choice for the synchronization between the client application, the mobile application, and the server. That was a very robust connection, very way of, very great, a great way of capturing all of this data in a standardized format and allowing it to sync no matter what type of activity we were talking about on the mobile app. And, and out of this came a, a few new, new tools that are now available to the community. There's uh, some software development kits that we've put, published out there for, again, making uh, tin can statements in iOS and in Android. Uh, there's uh, an op open source now tin can offline library as well that handles that disconnected scenario. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, again, this is one of the key promises that Tin Can had delivered on. It's one of the most straightforward processes. If, you, if you've heard me talk about Tin Can, you've probably, before you've probably heard me talk about a layers of the onion analogy where we, we start at the surface and the kind of the immediate benefits for Tin Can, then dive deeper into some of the more profound benefits. And you know, this is another great example of just a, that, that top level 
the things that we should have been able to do five years ago that we couldn't because our standards were getting in the way. Now all of a sudden they're very straightforward. They're very easy. Mobile deliveries, you know, that, that prime example, that one of those use cases that Tin Can was just designed for. It was one of those things when we were gathering requirements during Project Tin Can. Everybody was just screaming for, why can't we do that? And now we can. It's here. It's real. It's out in live. Tin Can's enabling it. It's enabling it to plug seamlessly into our uh, our key ecosystem, and so you know that, that's the key takeaway for you know this aspect of the solution. Is just look at how we're now able to facilitate doing mobile learning. This you know, this is a it shouldn't be a big step forward. This isn't rocket science, but it is a big step forward because our industry has been so lagging behind. It's not that we couldn't do mobile; it's that we couldn't bring mobile into our ecosystem very easily, and now we can. This is starting to happen, and, and it's finally, finally real. So you know, some of the next uh, things we want to talk about is mixing the old and the new. You know, not the whole world isn't going to all of a sudden migrate to tin can. And as much as we would love to be able to take a tin can first approach in everything that we do, and as much as we would like to be doing you know, all these amazing things that are, are now enabled, there is still the reality that you know we, we have this massive legacy base of content and systems that have built up over the last decade or more that we need to take into consideration. And so that that was one of the really interesting parts of you know this project is Lifeway coming in with a very realistic sense of, of the world. Say, hey, we we know Scorm's not going to go away anytime soon, but yet we still want to start taking advantage of this new platform, this new architecture. And so we we want to build our system since we're starting now off of what we know is going to be the standardized platform for the next decade to come. We want to be tin can first. We want to build it around the learning record store. But we, we still need to acknowledge that we've got all this the SCORM stuff, and we're going to have that for a long time. And so they're actually bring, they're actually still incorporating SCORM courses and regular old e-learning courses, and they're bringing them in. But then we're using our, our SCORM engine to translate, to deliver that SCORM content, then translate all of those results into Tin Can. And so all of that data is stored in the learning record store in Tin Can, the same format that things are coming in off of mobile and video and you know the other future learning delivery systems that they want to be including in here. And you know, this is a really powerful message to be sending out to the community is that one, it, it is possible to use SCORM and Tin Can harmoniously, and you know that's that's a, a big win for a lot of people with existing systems that they have a big investment into. And you know another um, another big point to be, be taking away from here is you know there is so much power in the low hanging fruit. We don't need to. There, there, I, I want to be thinking five years down the road. I want to be doing really advanced instruction, but there's so much benefit to just doing some of the simpler stuff right now for a lot, a lot of organizations. And sometimes I think as a community, we tend to look past some of the you know, more immediate benefits to jump to the really fun, futuristic type stuff. But, but we need to remember that some of the stuff you know, is really important to, to many, many real organizations, and there's a long way to go to, to get all of it set up. So, you know, the, the other key factor here was, was the ability for the learning data to tie into the reports and business processes and analysis. And so Tom's going to talk to us a little bit about you know what some of the things that they're doing with all of this data, what they're hoping to learn from the 10 can data, and how it's driving uh, their, their actual business processes. Yeah, it, it, we do provide a, a robust reporting suite through the application to those organization administrators. Uh, mainly dealing around a lot of what um, is traditional e-learning progress. Uh, the biggest learnings and our biggest area for our internal learning that is occurring around it, that TinCan is providing us is, is what's happening kind of behind the scenes that will allow us to drive our business processes. Um, we've got 2,400 videos on our site. We've spent a year and a half curating uh, an immense amount of content for it. Um, so some of the biggest learnings come around that content curation, library curation, and the management of it. Um, what types of content obviously are getting viewed? What are types are the most highly rated? What are the most uh, highly recommended? Which ones are people start starting at? And then why are they stopping if they are stopping? Uh, at what point specifically are they? Uh, we're looking at any of those metrics and, and then looking at um, our content editing processes as well and say, are they stopping for a specific reason? Uh, is there something in the content that we could cure or present better in, in 
video themselves. Um, what can we do then to actually uh, get those that are the viewed and the highest recommended uh, over that period of time? What can we do to, to boost that author or that content provider? Uh, maybe it's a specific topic that's timely. Uh, what can we do to help market that as well? So that's very important for us as well to help people know how, how to react to different live situations. These leaders are, are out there dealing with the people when tragedies happen and shootings in the mall. These are the people that will have to answer those questions the very next day when they're going into church. And they will have to deal with this and, and have to train their leaders into how to deal with this. And so um, real-time reporting back for us uh, as well as um, being able to, to look and, and, and know what um, – what that content is is actually how it's influencing and impacting their lives is, is critical for us. Uh, it helps us as far as influencing, obviously from a business sense, future contracts uh, for those providers that may uh, uh, we may be working with. Uh, you know, if, if they're not being completed or if they're not highly rated, um, what can we do to help boost that author to help get their message, which is very important, out there, uh, help them to be more clearly understood. Uh, it helps us to look at what what is the learning model, what the bigger picture, and as we start to to really take dip our toe, what we're dipping into our toe. One of the first experiences for us is in managing big data. Um, so, uh, who, who tracking who generating their own content? How are they used? What does that look like to the church model and to their learning model and to the content which they're using? All that is is information that it provides back to us um, that it will ultimately allow us to better serve them. As, um, but for us, we're just now beginning. We're excited. As Mike said, we're capturing a, a lot, um, and we may not use it all right now, but it, the capture is the key. Great. So you know, that's a, kind of a high-level summary of what we've done with Ministry Grid and you know, some of the business drivers around and the technologies in place. And so I want to take a second to kind of go through and summarize some of the key takeaways that we, you know, we thought were important to be lessons learned from this project or, or things to keep in mind as, as you're going through and trying to do your own in tin can implementations. And you know, the first high-level important thing. Let the business analyst analysis determine what data points you need to capture. Remember to Start with the end in mind. Start with the questions you want to ask. What do you want to know to make sure that you're capturing enough data to, you know, to answer those questions and then go capture some more for the questions that you're going to have tomorrow. And the second, the, the illustration of the, all this learning functionality being tied into a portal. This is one of the earliest incar incarnations of what I think was going to be a big, big trend in our industry right now, which is the rethinking of what we think constitutes learning systems across the enterprise. And, and this is a great example of you know, taking, the, taking the life ray portal, tying in some specific learning components, and turning it into a very, very highly tailored solution that meets a particular need in a non-traditional way. I wanted to point out the example of being able to deliver content from specialized servers now. In particular, that's very important for video. The ability now to use CDNs to deliver content I know is very important for a lot of people. You know, the, this ability to have a lot of freedom with how we deploy our content is, again, one of those very, very simple things that was a core requirement during Project Tin Can that gets us so much and is such really such a big pain point for so many within the industry, be they for you know, private reasons or control of data or optimization of the content experience, uh, this is you know, a big, big win for, for a lot of people. I wanted to highlight you know, the, the ability to deliver over you know, any, any different platform, whether it be on your mobile device or on your desktop and in your browser. You know, all of a sudden now we've got the same learning happening cross device. Again, it shouldn't be real hard, but it's what represents a big step forward. Uh, similarly, that connectivity optional, the, the ability to transition between online access and offline access and not have to be constantly tethered to the web in order to facilitate you know, the tracking of our, our learning events. Huge step forward. Another key takeaway was the, the tracking of new sets of data, not being confined to that SCORM data model, being able to look at the questions we want to answer and make sure we can capture the data in the ways that we want to, which even though it might be similar to SCORM, there's, there's probably a, a better way for your particular use case. 
The, the forward-looking ability for us to have data in a unified format coming in from many different sources. In this initial incarnation of ministry, we've got three or four different places, different sources of data that are coming in that we're, we're tracking. But we've got a platform now that allows that to be vastly expanded as the future versions come out there. Um, yeah, again, that future proofing, that al allowing for the addition of those future activity types, going with the architecture, the platform that is going to be uh, with us for a long time to come now. Uh, another key takeaway is the example of using legacy SCORM e-learning data and bringing that into the new tin can world, that realism, that pragmatism that says, you know, this, we, we need to deal with the, the way the world is, not the way we want the world to be. Um, and so that, that involves recognizing the fact that there is this uh, legacy base out there that we need to embrace and work with, not just try to throw away. Uh, another you know, key takeaway, the, the last one, is that you know, learning data can drive our core business processes. And I'm real excited about some of the, you know, the next uh, projects we're going to be able to talk about that show, how, it, like this one did, how learning data is now not just interesting from who's learning what, but it's actually you know, changing things at a more strategic level. If we can demonstrate how people are learning, what they're learning, that they are in fact learning, and that that has changed the performance of the individual or of the team, that's a very, very strategic, um, exciting step forward. Uh, so that, that's kind of a summary of the, the the, the key takeaways for you know what what we hope you guys see coming out of uh, this webinar here and so you know looking forward what's going to be coming down the road what's next what can you expect to see in the next few webinars that we're going to be putting out uh, mainly the one I'm just so excited about is you know more real world implementations there's this was just the first project to have wrapped up and gone into production there's a bunch more trailing out behind it that hopefully we'll be able to share with with you guys soon um, you know those people who got started when there were, it was a little bit more sane when things were around a 1.0 and for people who weren't quite as brave as um, Tom and Lifeway were here. Yeah, a big part of that is going to be an initiative we will be publicizing a lot of very soon called Watershed First that will showcase um, six or maybe seven actually now um, organizations who are taking on some innovative tin can projects but who have w agreed to be very public about it as we're going to go through it. We're going to take you step by step through each of those implementations. What are the business drivers? What are the technologies that they're using? How are they implementing things? And what do they want to learn? And you show the results in, in real time from the initial conceptions that are happening now all the way through the, the launches that will happen later this year. And we hope to be able to walk you through all those and you can watch them as they're happening. Uh, another big thing, you're, we're going to be talking a lot about recipes uh, over the next couple of months, these kind of common best practices and lessons learned for how do we um, structure tin can statements, what are the common design patterns that uh, we should as a community be discussing and starting to, to dive into and uh, agreeing upon. And so I think these are some of the big things that are going to be coming up next that I'm excited to see happen and to, uh, to share with you guys. And so uh, I want to wrap things up and I'm let you know if you guys are interested in talking about this stuff um, and anymore, we're offering some one-on-one -on -one sessions with anybody who attended this webinar. Uh, either uh, we're going to put up a poll question here now if you're interested in participating in one of those with either myself or uh, Andy or one of the other folks that we have around here that live and breathe this stuff. We, we love talking about it. We'd love to have any of you talk about how Tin Can could impact your organization. Uh, just you know, let us know in that poll and we'll, we'll reach out to you sometime over the next few weeks and, and try to set that up or visit the URL that you have on the, on the web page over there. So um, there's our contact information. Tom was generous enough to put his contact information up over as well. If you want to you know, reach out to any of us individually, there we are. And, and we, we want to know if, what you want to know. If you have ideas for future webinars or things you want to um, hear about, either include them in the chat right there or, or shoot us an email. We're, we'd love to hear from you and hear your thoughts about what would be really helpful for you to see. We're always looking for, for some new and interesting topics. And so yeah, that, that's the end of the, the formal part of the presentation. I see a, a bunch of questions over here. And so I'm going to just start diving into a few of them and excuse me, speak to them in the, the few minutes that we have left. And if you have any, any more, go ahead and fire away. So Patrick wants to know, so is Tin Can a canonical repository for a course, or does it store someone did something activity records? Does it replace a traditional LMS or work with it? Uh, that's a good question. 
Tin Can is not a canonical repository for a course. It is the store, you know, Tin Can, the Tin Can API, is a way of exchanging records about somebody did this, the I did this, activity records of learning between systems. The Tin Can API is the way of exchanging records between systems. One of the system that receives the, that learning data is called a learning record store or an LRS. A learning record store was originally conceived to be a part of an LMS. It was conceived to be the part of the LMS that tracks all of this data and structures it and makes sense of it and implements that Tin Can API for getting the data in and out. Uh, over the last you know, year or so, though, there's been a lot of interest in using the learning record store as kind of a standalone component, um, independent of a, a learning record store. And that's one of the trends that I think is kind of reshaping a bunch of how we think about learning systems. It's going to be really interesting to see uh, where that goes from here. So Evan wants to know, is this going to necessitate using a number of third parties in conjunction with Tin Can and our own resources? Or can we simply add videos and content to our own website and our LMS and link up Tin Can? So th the answer to this question is going to drastically change over time. Uh, you know, right now, if you want to track something over Tin Can, there's a, a bunch of people who started implemented it, but the vast majority of the world has not yet. This is early stages, early early days still for the technology. And so that means when we're doing a lot of these early implementations, these pilot projects, there's a lot of you know, duct tape and co hangers and putting st assembling stuff together on the fly, you know, developers getting to work. In the future, you're going to see a lot of more tools that are plug and play off the shelf. And that's where you know, I think this is going to get really interesting and, and really powerful. So Bruce wants to know. We'd like to know how you handle the massive number of records that can be generated by a tin can collector of activities for a large organization. Uh, that, that is a, a great question. This, is, this has the ability to scale out massively. You know, tin can can capture tons and tons of, of data. And yes, there, it is going to generate you know, some very interesting scalability challenges. I, you know, I, can, I can say that our, our developers are spending a lot of time on, on those problems, giving a lot of, of careful thought. Uh, our core technology, our, our watershed learning record store is leveraging a lot of the, the tools on the Amazon platform to achieve some of that scalability. But it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that happens from a technical perspective. Uh, from a kind of a business perspective, you know, how do you handle the massive number of records and the overwhelming amount of information? Uh, that's a, a really interesting question as well. And we, we've taken the approach that you know we want to break down the questions we are asking into, into small discernible questions and into, into problems that can be tackled. We're not trying to yet build tools that can understand everything. We're focusing instead on going on the bottom up and answering specific questions for specific scenarios and then working up into common reusable patterns from there. So SP wants to know, is it fair to say that SCORM will still be needed to track the progress of a user on a specific course, bookmarks, exams, et cetera, and TINCAM will track the actual key achievement, exam scores, this is the key section of the course, et cetera, within that course? Um, no, that is not actually necessarily the case. If TINCAM has the ability to completely do everything that SCORM does from a tr data tracking perspective. Uh, so you know, SCORM is not required to track the progress of a user on a specific course. TINCAM can track all of that in a lot of detail. SCORM is required to stick around mostly for the fact that you know, there's so much of an installed base that we have so far. And there's going to be cases where you know, there's a good old SCORM course that's been around for a decade and it's just, nobody's going to bother to crack it open and redo it to convert it to to tin can for a long time. And so you know, the, the SCORM is going to be part of the ecosystem in that sense, kind of in the same sense that you know DVDs have been around and we're into streaming media now, but I only just recently threw my VCR out a couple of years ago because they, they still have this collection of tapes that maybe I want to watch one day. Maybe, maybe somebody wants to see that old video of my wedding that we have sitting around there. It's going to be the same thing with SCORM. We're going to have these courses that are hanging around that we still need to, to be able to play even though there's newer technology that's out there. Um, Tom, this might be a, a, good que a question for you from Patrick. Can you comment on how big the team was that did the implementation in person years? In person years? <laughs> um, it, it, was a, it was a large development team from our side. Uh, obviously, with so many uh, different vendors, um, we had uh, 
six to eight probably from each vendor at different points of the of the project team as well as our internal development team. So over the 18 months, we've probably pulled in 30 to 40 different developers and different uh, experts in different fields uh, between all the different vendors. Cool. So uh, Candace wants to know, any information on how SCORM core creation is being approached now in light of tin can availability? So that, that's a good question. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, right now, a lot of people who, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so the SCORM works. SCORM's been around for a decade, and it still just works. And so there's plenty of people who, are, you know, who don't have a need to migrate to tin can just yet. And I'm not trying to encourage them to, to migrate yet. If, you know, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And people continue to work on that existing platform. We're, in, we're encouraging people to migrate to Tin Can once they have a need for it. You know, in this case, if maybe they need to put something on a, a CDN or mobile. Once, once there's an actual use case upon which Tin Can is a better solution, that's the point at which we are in, encouraging people to start to, to migrate up there. Um, and so, you know, I don't think Tin Can is affecting SCORM course creation per se. You know, the, the, that legacy model is continuing to you know, work just fine and plug along. Uh, I hope that people, as they approach new projects, are looking for um, you know, interesting things to do and new ways of delivering training and taking a fresh approach to their instructional design. That's one of the things I often tell people with Tin Can is you know, the, the key takeaway, if you take nothing else away, is that you can take a fresh approach to your instructional design and not be confined to the models that have been pervaded the last decade. We don't need to just put everything into a page turner e-learning course in a browser. Use the technologies and instructional modalities that are best for the learning experience you want to deliver and let tracking take a backseat instead of tracking be the thing that drives how you deliver learning. So um, I'll take one more question over here from, from Allison. What would be your advice to an organization currently revisiting their use of an LMS? What should they consider to ensure whatever ecosystem is reimagined is future-proof to include tin can at some point in the future? Ah, that's a really great question. Um, so, uh, you know, I would really start from the beginning and say, okay, what are the requirements that need to be met? And in some cases, you know, I, I'm not I'm not arguing that the LMS is dead or obsolete or anything. From, Far from it. Um, in, in many cases, LMSs are still valuable tools, and uh, you know, I'm not going to say you shouldn't use one. That you know, that's in the in mo many, if not most, contexts, that's still going to be the, the right answer. And so, you know, it, then it comes to okay, how can we future-proof our, our LMS? I would give your your vendor the um, you know the third degree about are you what are your plans for starting to support Tin Can, and make sure you're getting the right answers from them. And that's going to include not just giving lip service to Tin Can and supporting it at what I call the SCORM parity level, which is basically do the same things you could do with SCORM but with different plumbing. But really embracing it, really embracing Tin Can's ability to track, you know, things like informal learning, and for that data to be free to come and go, and to be able to really analyze that data in an intense way. Um, and so, you know, I'd really make sure your vendor has those intentions in mind as they are um, going forward with their plans. You know, but you know, in other cases, the LMS might not be the right choice. If you, you have a, a situation where you know, what you really want is just kind of a simple portal that has learning stuff in it, but then has some tracking in there, kind of like LifeWay did here, then you might want to look at a, a model that uses the learning record store as the place where all that information is gathered, and, and other tools are, that are best of read are delivering the, the learning experiences independently. Uh, you know, these are the types of things that we, we love to uh, brainstorm with people. So if you want to talk more a little bit about this, Allison, feel free to, to reach out to, to us and you know, we, we'd love to, to bounce around some ideas. And the same goes for, um, for any of you who, uh, who want to talk about this stuff in, in more detail. We, we, there's a bunch of us here. We literally do nothing but talk about Tin Can all day long and we'd love to do that with you and your organization. Uh, whether we wind up working together like we did with Lifeway or not, we, we really just you know, love having the conversation. So uh, with that, we're going we're gonna to wrap things up. I want to thank Tom for uh, being with us today and, and spending some time sharing their experiences and for allowing us to, to share this story with the world. I'm, I'm excited to see these things starting to, to come to fruition and I hope you guys thought that this was a, a good use of your, your afternoon. So everybody, uh, take care and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks a lot.